Hi, welcome back to Immunology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Make sure to like this video and subscribe. All right, in this video, we're going to discuss the classical pathway of complement activation. And this pathway requires antibodies. Okay? The other two pathways that we're going to talk about for activating complement, they do not require antibodies. So even though the classical pathway is usually the first pathway that's discussed, that does not mean it occurs first. In fact, upon initial exposure to an antigen, this is actually probably the last pathway that's activated because it takes time to build antibodies. So keep that in the back of your mind. And I think it will be pretty obvious that it requires antibodies uh, whenever we uh, start going over it. So let's just go now. All right. These red structures right here, these are your antibodies. And this is the surface of a cell, a pathogen that's a foreign invader, and our immune system wants to get rid of it. All right, now, potentially on the surface of that pathogen, probably in the, on the surface of the plasma membrane, there are proteins. And the proteins can serve as potential antigens, and if the antibody is specific for that antigen, as we've talked about, the antigen can uh, bind the antibody and vice versa. Okay, So here you have specific antibodies uh, that are now bound to the antigen on the surface of the bacterial cell. Okay, Now, one thing we often forget about antibodies is on the constant region of antibodies, particularly IgM and IgG, which are the only two classes of antibodies that are able to activate complement. On the constant region, there is a loop. It's called the FC loop of the antibody. Now, if you have an anti antibody that's floating free in the blood and it's not bound to antigen, that FC loop is not exposed. And so there won't be any complement activation. But it turns out that when the antibody complexes with, an, with its antigen, there's a change in conformation of the antibody which exposes that loop. In fact, on, at least on this side, you can't see it because it's bound to the complement protein. But on the other side, you can see this exposed loop, this kind of hump right here. You can even see it on the other one. So whenever antibody binds antigen, that FC loop becomes exposed. And that FC loop is the binding site for a protein, which is the first complement protein in the cascade, called C1Q. Now, C1, in other words, the first complement protein, has more parts than just C1Q. It actually also has C1R and C1S. And there's actually two R units and two S units. Okay. Now, whenever C1Q becomes activated in binding to the antibody, it's going to change conformations, which affects the R subunits right here. The R subunits change conformation, and they become active serine proteases, which clip these S subunits. And when the S subunits become clipped, they become active serine proteases. And in fact, when we talk about C1 activating other members of the complement system, the S is the active serine protease that's going to do that for all other proteins. Let's look at that. So C1, when it becomes activated, um, the first protein it's going to activate is C4. Now, we're going to have this little concept in complement proteins that complement proteins start out as, like we mentioned in the first video, the zymogen form, meaning they're inactive. And they have two parts, generally, an A part and a B part. Now, there's a little discrepancy in this figure, which I'll go over in a minute. But in general, the B part, B stands for bound, meaning whenever the, a, pro, a serine protease complement protein cuts the inactive complement protein, it cuts it basically in half into an A part and a B part. The B part remains bound and kind of stays with the complex. The A part floats away. Okay? So for example, when, when C1 becomes activated, it cuts C4 into a C4A, which floats away, and a C4B, which stays bound. All right, now remember this is a cascade. So once C4 gets split into C4B, 
C4B is now an active serine protease. All right? C4B can now split C2 into C2A and C2B. Okay? I will also mention that this serine protease on C1, C1 can also activate C2 into C2A and C2B. Now, I'm going to mention this about C2. There are some older textbooks and older sources that will say that C2A it remains bound and C2B floats away. Um, most newer texts and newer sources will actually be consistent with the B's and the A's. All the A's float away and the B's remain bound. So I'm actually going to, this is an older figure I guess because it says the C2A remains bound. The newer sources will call what the older sources call C2A a C2B. So this is actually going to be a complex of C4B and C2B. Okay, C2B is actually what's now bound. C2A floats away. Um, older textbooks erroneously named it before they had this consistency, and so um, C2A would remain bound. We're going to use the convention that B stands for bound, and so we have this complex of C4B and C2B. Now, C4B, C2B form a complex, and that complex is called C3 convertase. C3 convertase means it's going to have the power to convert C3. Okay, We're going to talk about that in a minute, but first I want to talk about this. A lot of the complement proteins, in particular C4B and C3B, are going to have this internal thioester bond. This is a thioester functional group. This thioester bond is not exposed prior to hydrolysis of the C4 molecule. So when it's just C4 in its inactive state, this thioester bond is not exposed. But whenever C1 hydrolyzes uh, C4 into C4A and C4B, then the C this thioester bond is exposed. Why is this important? Well, on the bacterial surface, particularly on proteins, there might be a serine residue. This is the amino acid serine, or its R group. And it turns out that the hydroxyl group can attack the thioester and split it, meaning that the serine can become esterified to the C4B, okay? particularly through the carbonyl of the thioester bond. And that process occurs for C4, and it's called C4B attachment meaning a serine residue of the bacterial surface can become attached to the C4B. So proteins like C4B are actually attached to the bacterial surface. Okay, And this is just the other piece of the C4B that would kind of loop around and still be attached over here. Okay, It's just now a free cysteine group. Okay, And you see here that C4B is attached. Now I mentioned that I have C4B and C2B, this should be C2B, they form an enzyme complex called C3 convertase. And C3 convertase is a serine protease. It's going to split C3 into C3A and C3B. The C3B also is going to have a similar thioester bond. In fact, I actually just took the C4 figure and replaced all the C4s with C3. Uh, you can see that it's going to function exactly the same way. Another serine residue on a bacterial surface protein can become attached to the C3B in exactly the same way, in a simple nucleophilic substitution kind of reaction. And C3B is now attached. Okay. Um, this is not a great picture that shows this, but notice whenever you have the C3 convertase, C4B, C2B, splitting C3 into C3B and C3A, the C3B component sticks with the C3 convertase. Okay? So now you'll have C4B, C2B, C3B. When you have all, these, all three of these B components, C4B, C2B, and C3B together, now you have something called C5 convertase. Okay, 
And much in the same way that C3 converte split C3, you can imagine C5 converte is going to split C5. Okay, and that's exactly what this is doing right here. We have this C4B, C2B, C3B called C5 convertase, which is going to split C5 into C5A and C5B. Okay, and actually, I didn't put it, but much in the same way that C3B and C4B have this internal thioester bond, C5B has the same thing. Once C5 is split into C5A and C5B, this thioester bond on C5B is exposed. It becomes attached to a bacterial surface protein, and you can see that C5B right here. Okay, now. C5B is going to recruit some other proteins to the surface of the bacterial cell. Or it doesn't have to be a bacteria, but you know what I mean. It's going to recruit other proteins there, i.e. C6, C7, C8, and then a host of C9s. Okay? The C9 proteins are going to arrange themselves, and they're all going to insert into the, into the membrane of the protein all the way through and protrude into the inter intracellular space of, the, of that cell. And by doing that and by forming this arrangement, they form a pore. A pore that now allows things from the intracellular space to leak out and things from the extracellular area to leak in. This arrangement of proteins the C5B all the way down to C9, this cluster of C9s, this is called the MAC or membrane attack complex. Why is it called that? Because you're literally attacking the membrane of the cell. So membrane attack complex. And because this is now inserted into the cell and you have this pore, the pathogen can no longer regulate its internal environment. Things leak out, things leak in, and that causes cell lysis, okay? In fact, what we're going to see in the alternative pathway and the lectin pathway of complement activation in the next few videos is that all those pathways in different ways are going to all try to produce the same membrane attack complex. How does complement kill bacteria? Well, what we're showing here is that uh, complement is killing bacteria and potential other pathogens through the membrane attack complex. It's a very sadistic way to kill the cell. You're inserting a pore into its membrane, preventing it from regulating its internal environment. Things leak in, things leak out, and the cell bursts and it dies. Okay, so this is how the classical pathway works. Okay. Um, we're going to skip that for now. In the next video, we're going to go over the lectin pathway of complement activation. Now, I prefaced this uh, particular video by mentioning that the classical pathway requires antibodies. And so I asked you to think about how that probably means that because we don't initially have antibodies for an antigen upon first exposure, the classical pathway does not occur first. In fact, the other two pathways are what are going to occur prior to the classical pathway in terms of first exposure to that particular antigen. And the reason that they're able to occur first is they don't require antibodies. In fact, what we're going to cover next, the lectin pathway, this is actually going to require something else. It's going to require sugars on the surface of the bacterial cell, so maybe on glycoproteins, things like that, in order to activate uh, the complement system. Okay? The alternative pathway doesn't even require that. But these pathways are going to occur first. I will also say one more thing. The lectin pathway is, compared to the alternative pathway, the lectin pathway is by far more similar to the classical pathway. In fact, the only stage of the lectin pathway that's different is the first step. After that, everything's the same. We'll go over the lectin pathway in the next video. So make sure to like this and subscribe for future videos. Thank you for watching this.